Welcome to the Alcohol Addiction Podcast. My name is Lee Davey. I'm not an alcoholic and I refuse to be anonymous. Today, my guest is Ruby Roth, the coolest name I have ever heard in the history of names. Is that your real name? It's my real name, but it's not the first time someone's asked me that. Dude, it is so Quentin Tarantino. <laughs> Thank you. Right? Um, Ruby, I found you through V is for Vegan. Where did I get that book? Where was I? I was in... You steal it from the library. I know you did. No, I didn't steal it from the library. I was somewhere in California, and I was in this really trendy shop buying lullabies, but from Depeche Mode. (laughs) Like baby lullabies, right? And your book was there, and I just thought, I'm vegan, see? So I thought, I'm going to get that for my girl. Awesome. I'm going to sort her out. And she loves it, you know? That's a fun one. It's like, it's the fun rhyming light book um, of the collection. She's, for only, the young. she's only 15 months old and she always finishes off the end of it, you know? Yeah, they like, memorize. There's so much space in there. They memorize it to a T. Absolutely. When I say eggs from a chicken's butt, she's like, whoa, like every single time. <laughs> yeah, that's Fantastic. That is the epic page of that book. (laughs) Well, we're not going to mess about, Ruby. We're going to start off with some really kind of gentle and soft kind of discussion, okay? Okay. (laughs) No, we're not. We're going to hit the ground running. Um, I took this from your blog post, I think, on your website. So I'm going to read it out, and then I'm going to ask you to talk about it. You said, I took my money and my body as a vessel out of a collusive network of corrupt, broken, racist, discriminatory, predatory, destructive, unjust, archaic systems. And it wasn't because I didn't like chicken or because I could never kill an animal. Um, tell me a little bit about the passion that went into that, where it's coming from. Um, people always ask me, you know, wh- why did you go vegan? And it's, uh, you you know, a lot of people will say it's for the animals or it's for my health or whatever, but it was, for me, it was everything across the board and it was getting to understand the underbelly of um, animal agriculture industry in America and realizing this collusive network um, of organizations and government, um, you know, the, the FDA and the USDA and the pharmaceutical companies and environmental destruction and medicine and how doctors are educated in this whole circle that works in tandem um, to make people's default choices feel normal. Mm. um, They're actually just a system that's designed. So once I understood that, I I felt like I, you know, turned over a pebble and found a mountain. Um, And, I just feel like at this moment of time, in the context of the era that we live in now, uh, going vegan, plant-based, whatever you want to call it, is the right thing to do. At any other time in history, if we weren't facing the massive you know, global destruction and uh, environmental destruction and health issues, I don't necessarily know that I would choose to be vegan. Um, it's not because like I said, that I don't think I could kill an animal. I think I could, maybe not a cow, but I could fish and I could, you know, probably kill something small if I had to. Um, and it wasn't because I didn't like chicken. Like I liked, I was a meat eater. I liked it. Mm. Um, it's just that once I realized what I was involved in, I wanted to take myself out of that system. And I was an activist already, but hadn't realized that until you embody the change that you want to see, none of your activism really does anything. I went through life 35 years, blissfully unaware what the fuck was going on beyond my own kind of like biased view of life. Right. Mm -hmm. And then at 35, the first thing I stumbled across was alcohol. You know, I I'd been drinking it all my life thinking it was normal and pleasurable and fucking brilliant. And then I realized, hang on a minute. I've been programmed to drink this from birth. I didn't even have a choice. Like, um, and then from there, that led me to meditation, led me to other areas of my life that I needed to sort out, quitting my job. And then down the line, then it came to, well, if I'm going to refuse to put this poison in my body, what other poisons am I going to? And that led to 
um, you know, being vegan. But I look around me and like nobody else is, was thinking the same as I was thinking. Nobody else was acting and taking the decisions that I was taking. Everybody looked at me and thought that I was some weird fucking outlier that they need to ostracize from the community. Like nobody wanted to touch me with a barge pole. Talking to me was like putting a mirror up in front of their face, I think. So what, what was it about you, Ruby, that made you stand out? I mean, or was you fortunate enough to be around people who were uh, um, backing you? How do you, look, there's 7.5 billion people in the world. Most of them are blind and you weren't. Why is that? Um, like I said, I was an activist. I was mostly involved in social justice. I was interested since high school um, in anti-racism um, organizations and work. And, you know, I was marching, you know, in 2000, whatever, when I was in college at the anti-war rallies. And, you know, like I had this consciousness, but it wasn't until a friend pointed out to me that my eating habits did not match my morals and my values that um, I took stock of what I was doing. Um, and I don't know, I just happened to be open to that criticism. Um, I think because being a critical thinker is one of my, you know, it's one of my biggest studies throughout my life. I like the underbelly of things. And that pointed out to me that I was missing something. And, you know, when I watched the undercover footage, and started doing the research, I felt stupid. And I felt like you can, it made me look at protesting even differently. Like I don't like to protest anymore because um, you can mouth off all you want and protest and resist, but you're actually just still working within the framework of what someone else wants or doesn't want. You're just resisting and, and fighting what's being put on you instead of pulling your money out of the system and actually changing things. Mm. And, and why children? I was teaching art at an after-school program um, here in Los Angeles, and the kids started asking me questions, you know, as, as recess would come along, and they would be served um, string cheese and milk, and I would never share, um, and they started asking me why, and I was kind of tight-lipped about it at first, and then I said, you know what, I'm going to go find a book, bring it in, we can do an art project, I'll talk about it a little bit. Um, and when I went to go look for something, found very few books. And what I did find, you know, was about a talking animal or a talking vegetable. And these were really street smart kids. Um, they grew up in a tough neighborhood. And I talked to them like normal people, not like babies. And A, um, I think those books take away from the very rich emotional lives of animals that actually exist and B, from the children's intelligence and what they are able to manage, capable of understanding. So I picked kids because I was, um, it, it, it melded my two interests, my interest in art, because I was always headed into the art field. I was an artist, always, and my interest in social justice. And I have those two degrees in art and American studies which is the history of America through the lens of race, class, gender, and sexuality. And so I took all my interests and I created this book of art based on art, my art, um, that had a social justice thread through the, the, um, as the theme. Um, and I picked kids because I didn't see anything that spoke to them in a language that I related to. Yeah, I think what you stumbled across is quite brilliant. You know, it's... I often think about this uh, in terms of alcoholism. I like, I call alcoholism an invisible, violent and dominant belief system. You know, it's violent because it kills 3.3 million people a year. It's dominant because 52% of people in the world have tried drinking alcohol. Um, and it's invisible because we do so thinking it's normal and pleasurable, you know? And I often think to myself, what's the best, what's the best place to start teaching people about this and it's it's obviously children but it's really difficult to get in there and have those conversations and i think the way that you did it with vs for vegan is uh, an excellent way to do that and that's made me think of a a is for alcoholism um to do something quite similar but but i think there's a reason you didn't find a book when you went looking for it i should imagine 
I, I would imagine publishers wouldn't want to touch this with a barge pole. Yeah, it was uh, very difficult to find a publisher. I just went through rejection after rejection after rejection. And that is because, uh, first of all, this was 2008 when I was seeking and veganism just wasn't in the mainstream um, like it is now. But also, in the bigger picture, the any industry based around children is ruled by a certain concept of childhood that we've all inherited in the yeah. modern world. There's no, uh, and that concept is that uh, children are dependent, completely dependent creatures on adults. They're fragile, um, they're pure, they're innocent, and we can't scare them, we can't dare make them do any work. It's actually a Victorian invention that was handed down to us. There's no universal definition of childhood. Um, you know, and you look at other countries and kids are wielding machetes and opening coconuts when they're, you know, four years old, mm. um, or they're expected to look after their siblings or help collect firewood or work, work at the marketplace. Um, you know, meanwhile, here in the West, we're impressed if, you know, a, a four-year-old can tie her shoe. Yeah. So the entire industry is, is based on a myth, a concept. And so people are afraid of risking money, comes back to money um, on a project that will not, you know, return, show any return. Um, that being said, once the first book came out in 2009, um, by the time they did, they didn't want vegan or vegetarian even on the title, mm. you know, they didn't want it in there. And I fought for it to be. And by the time my second book came out in 2012, um, they wanted the word vegan in the title because as I had promised, um, it was becoming a search term that people mm. were looking for. And when you write a book like Vias for Vegan, what are you thinking about in terms of your audience? Like, so part of your audience is my 15 month old daughter, you know, what are the things that you need to get in there? Because it's easy to look at it and think, oh, it's just a kid's book. But there, there must be a lot of incredible amount of thought that goes into it. It's like, how am I going to convey my message here without scaring the hell out of the kids, with making sure it sinks in, all that kind of stuff? What are you thinking about when you're creating these types of books? Um, it's definitely a balance. Um, and I think what I'm known for is, is a balance between um, the truth and not sugarcoating things but not scaring children and finding the, the balance so that I'm creating something that's truthful, but um, not beating around the bush and is manageable for a child's capacity. V is for vegan is for my, you know, my youngest, youngest readers. Um, but that was my third book. So it's kind of a prequel to the other two. Um, the other two are a little bit heavier. They're more um, hard hitting as far as the motives. Um, but I, I say if I had decided to create a book of collected photographs from the animal agriculture industry, it would have been a frightening horror book. Mm -hmm. Kids don't need to be scared. Like the point is not to scare them. It's to make them understand a system and have them start creating their own morals and values around whether they want to be involved or not. Mm. Um, so in V is for Vegan, I, I wanted to keep it light and funny, but I touched on um, all the main tenets of veganism. So food and clothing and animal testing, they're all in there, yeah. um, but it's light and funny and it's easy. And the other ones, you know, the, the illustrations um, are serious. They're not always light and funny and whimsical um, but the message on each page is that we don't have to fear anything that we have the power to change so there's always an affirmation there to help kids understand um, they don't have to be upset they just have to act they have to do something what i what i love about it is an, it's an entry point it's a it's a really good way of an adult explaining to a child what this state of being is about because a lot of adults me included will probably screw it up because when we're, we're not 
we're not really very good at getting down to their level and talking at their level, you know, and we are more likely to scare the living crap out of them by, you know, sticking them in front of the earthlings or something and say, watch that and see how you get on with it, you know? And I think, but then I, I think what you just said is like on their level, I don't think you even have to think about that. Right. Um, right. I, when I was writing the book, I was like, well, how would I just say it? How would I explain it to anybody? Right. And so I think we have to move a little bit away from that. It's so they can handle anything, even if they don't understand all the words that you're saying, mm -hmm. um, they're going to take it in and you using big words with them increases their mental capacity and their vocabulary from the jump. Okay. For people listening, me and Ruby had a little bit of a technical, uh, hitch. The gremlins were in there and we got a little bit disrupted. So we are now kind of doing part two, we'll call it, Ruby. Um, hopefully it won't be too much of an, an issue for you listening to this or watching it. I will kick off straight from where we left off last time. I was listening. Except to that I, I have bangs now. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, you look like you've got more hair. You know? <laughs> I've, I've got more hair too. You know? Yeah, huge difference from yeah, last time. Yeah, it's grown a little bit. Um, we talked a little bit as we broke off in the last segment about the factors that we have to take into consideration when writing books for such a young audience. Okay. And yeah. you said, as I was talking away about how adults need to learn to speak to children, you said to me, they hand, they can handle anything. Yes. And I want you to just expand upon that a little bit more because you've got a lot of people listening to this who have got alcohol issues and they've got children and they're not quite sure how to act or behave around them. You know, they're not so sure if they should drink in, in secret, you know, all that kind of stuff. And of course, children are more, um, more in tune and more intuitive than we give them credit for. Uh, and that, that in itself could be a great thing. <laughs> and I guess sometimes if we're doing things that we shouldn't be doing, it's a bad thing. So just ex expand a little bit on what you were saying on uh, they could handle that, you know? Well, when I was teaching uh, at an elementary school and the kids started asking me questions about my vegan habits, um, I was, you know, tiptoeing around the subject because I didn't want to scare them. I didn't want to get in trouble. And so, you know, a lot of those same things that I'm sure the same with alcohol, you don't, you don't want to give them too much information and you don't want to make them feel like the adults around them are not stable or, you know, all these feelings come up. But what I realized on the job was that when you speak frankly to children, they really pay attention and they're much more intrigued because so many people talk to kids like they're, you know, kids, mm. um, they talk down to them. And so when they find someone who speaks to them like an equal, it's really exciting. Um, they feel like they have a friend and that they're being let in on a secret, you know, of some kind that, you know, no one's talked to them like this before. So, I really truly feel that kids can handle any topic. You don't have to come in scaring them. Um, when I wrote my books, I illustrated them, you know, to be, you know, for example, animal testing. I painted the labs. Um, I painted sad looking animals with, you know, little ouchies on them mm. and band-aids. Um, but I didn't want to include, you know, a picture of the lab and what actually happens to those animals because it's a horror show and it's so frightening. Yeah. And you don't, the point was not to scare them. It was to have a discussion about um, our choices and how we spend our money um, and, and democracy ultimately and where you put your energy and your vote, how you vote with your um, choices and your money um, and supply and demand. It was a bigger lesson. Um, but all of that can be, boil down to simple language. And I think you can sit down with any kid and say, Hey, here's what's going on. And, um, this is this substance and I'm trying not to do this substance anymore because it's actually really bad for me. And it makes me feel this. And, um, um, I think you have to maybe be, be aware of making them feel like nothing's out of control, like that they're being taken care of no matter what happens. Um, so that no child feels unsafe, but you can have any kind of candid conversation with a kid. Mm. Jude, my eldest, he's 17 now. He was 10, nine, 
yeah, nine when I gave up drinking, I think. Yeah, but nine. I don't remember having a sit down conversation with him about it, but I, I certainly know in the ensuing years as he's gotten older, I think maybe around the 14 year age when I realized myself, oh, this is the age when I started drinking. Uh, I think I better have a conversation with him. And I, I really do follow the Brad Blunt and radical honesty kind of theme here when it comes to talking to your children. I, I really don't like talking to, down to them. I don't like treating them like children. I like talking to them about adult stuff because I think it prepares them more for the world. Um, so when Definitely. You- and they, they start to form... Uh, they start to form their own values and their opinions based on your conversations. And also what you're not saying, kids are also absorbing everything around them. You know, the, they learn, they say they learn the most from what you're not saying. Mm. So I personally think whatever's going on, it's better to get it out in the open and actually discuss and learn how to manage any feelings that, you know, the reality brings up versus just not touching it to begin with. Because I, I remember when I, I was smoking when I was drinking as well, and Jude was a type of kid who would be into everything, right? And he was always asking why, why, why. But with cigarettes, he, he never touched the packet. He never talked about it. He never mentioned it. It was almost like intuitively he knew that this was wrong, and he didn't know how to kind of like to deal with it almost. Um, yeah. So I think, what are we saying here? If I, I, We're saying here that if we are going through some sort of change or no, let's just peel this back a little bit. Let's break this down. Let's say a child says to you, what is that mummy? And you're, you're drinking alcohol. What you're saying Ruby is irrespective of their age, this should be a conversation around what it is um, and why mommy or daddy is drinking it. Do you think that changes dependent on what age the child is? I really don't. I mean, the words you use might change, um, but I think, you know, even the younger the child is, all you're doing is increasing their vocabulary. Even if they don't completely understand what you're saying, you're still creating an atmosphere of honesty and discussion and communication um, and learning. And that's, if that's what a child grows up with, that becomes the norm. There's mm-hmm. more to talk about. There's more learning. There's more just consciousness and awareness as a foundation of somebody's life. And I, and I think that a lot of conversations, you know, instead of talking to kids are really valuable when, when the adult asks questions instead of just talking. Um, so when you start asking a kid, how do you feel about this? And what do you think of this? Um, how does it, how does it, your body feel when you eat a cupcake? You know, so you're, you're asking them questions to get them thinking and paying attention to themselves mm. and substances that they put inside their body instead of just telling them. Like a good question would be, how do you feel when mommy, been, how do you feel when mommy's drunk? How do you feel when mommy's been drinking? Which if I think what's, what, what I'm thinking about here, Ruby, is it's actually wrong to be thinking how do we have the alcohol conversation? How do we have the meat conversation? How do we have the sugar conversation? It's more about how are we going to um, communicate with our child full stop, right? Yes. So, yeah. so if we have this almost like, uh, I keep referring to Brad Blanton because he was the one I remember that was saying, you know, stop treating your kid like a kid, you know, just treat him like an adult. Like um, if we are having those conversations as the norm, then alcohol and, and, and meat and our decisions to not or eat sugar, or whatever, is a, are a lot more easier for us to have those conversations, right? Yeah. And you start pointing out, you know, how people are tricked, um, you know, with, with you driving on the freeway and you see a giant billboard um, for fast food or for milk or, you know, whatever it is. And you have a conversation about it. Like, oh, that's a, that's a happy cow. They're using the image of a happy cow when the industry really doesn't have a happy cow in it. That's how they get people to buy things. You introduce kids to the game, mm. um, you know, that they're pawns in, that we're all pawns in. And, you know, even at the grocery store, you point out, oh, this, this cartoon animal on the sugary uh, cereal 
is placed on a lower shelf because they want you to want it. And that's how they get you to want things and they get your attention that way so that they start seeing you know, themselves in this system and that there's choice in the system, but that, you know, that it's a big game mm. and kids love games and they understand games and they understand good guy and bad guy. Um, and I, I think just kind of helping kids understand, you know, and revealing the invisible forces that shape our thinking, that shape society. I think that is what you and I are talking about. Um, that's a bigger conversation than the specifics of alcohol or meat or sugar or yeah. smoking. If you, if you think, for example, about what we talk about here at The Truth About Alcohol and on the Strive Community Forum, on our training course that we have, our three-month training course, we focus on the fact that alcoholism is an invisible, violent, and dominant belief system, right? So we're saying that from birth, uh, in most of Western culture, or particularly the, the UK, I know that for, for sure, is you're raised in a society and an environment um, where it's actively encouraged that when you reach a certain age, drinking alcohol is not just normal, but it's really, really good. And, and we talk about the fact that somewhere around 13, 14 years of age, Mark, it could be a little bit younger, we are actually looking forward to drinking alcohol as a, as a rite of passage because of this way of, you know, this brainwashing, if you like, right? And if that is true, and that's something that we believe in, then if we have children ourselves, we have to do everything we can in our power to show them an alternative to that conditioning. Um, and we do that by doing what me and Ruby are talking about, is having regular conversations about everything, every choice that we're making, every action that we take. And I guess that's what you're talking about in terms of raising critical thinkers? Is that what you're talking yeah, about? absolutely critical thinkers. Um, you know, my motto is love deeply, think critically, act responsibly. I think when you give kids the information they need to make educated choices, they choose wisely. Mm. So raising a child who has body awareness, who has food awareness, who has choice awareness, then you know, alcohol is just the same as anything else. You know, they pay attention to what they're putting in their bodies, who's marketing it to them, how they feel when it's in their bodies, and what kind of person they want to be. And I guess there are, a f there are rules that we have to abide by as well. So there are legal rules, right, I guess. So, you know, my son Judy's 17 now. He can't drink in a pub until he's 18. So... I mean, let's get this one thing out of the way because I think it's really, I think it's really important that we talk about. It, and then I'll go back to that. Actually, we're not saying we're not saying we should tell our children what to do, are we? So, no, so it's almost the opposite. Yeah, me and you, me and you are vegan. I, I certainly don't drink, but I'm not going to tell my kids not to eat meat, not to eat dairy, and not to drink. Um, we need to raise our children to be more aware, so they can make. Uh, they can use their critical thinking skills that we're developing and make yes. more choices. You want to explain your motivations and the motives behind your choices. Mm. So expand on that a little bit more then. So let's say, for example, sugar is a classic one. Let's say we've got kids that are at a party. Everybody's chomping down cake and, and sweets and stuff. And I don't eat sugar. I don't particularly want my daughter to eat it. And I think at a certain age... I, I want to make that choice for her, you know, and it's, and I don't even know when this changes. So right now she's seven, 17 months. I don't want her to be eating sugar. We was at my dad's house on Sunday. We had, we had dinner and he wanted to give a cheesecake. And I said, no, you're not giving a cheesecake. But, but at some point I'm going to let her to, to try it and do what she wants, but I'm going to be talking to her about that. Right. Um, yeah. I and I think it's important that kids don't feel uh, that there's not like any anxiety around food. Um, you know, that, that, that there's just, um, that you foster awareness. It just keep, I keep going back to that because it's, you, it, you don't want to create rules where they don't understand what the motivations are. You don't want to create something that feels like, oh, they want to rebel against it eventually. You just want them to understand 
what the substance is, what the motivations are for not putting in your body. And that if it's around, it's not, you know, it's not going to poison them. It's not something they should hide from you. It's not, you know, this, this illegal substance, but just always fostering an understanding in, in my house, when I was helping to raise a child, um, there were no food rules. We just included her on everything that we were learning about food as we were learning it. Mm. And, you know, at school functions or birthday parties, it's like she was free to eat whatever she wanted. And usually she would say, no, thanks. I'm good. Or we'd bring our own things and she would share that with the table or she would say, okay, let's wait till after and we'll go get, you know, vegan ice cream at wherever. Um, but there wasn't any like anxiety or feeling left out or, or feeling weird about it. It was just, it was so normalized with us. Like the, the motives behind not eating the sugar or um, any dairy or animal products mixed in with something was like, she understood it. She understood why we were doing it and she was aligned with that. But there was many times where I said, go ahead. And it's, it's probably has dairy in it, but if you want it, you know, it's not going to hurt you. Um, and she would say, that's okay. I think you make a really important point then. I remember when I became vegan and I stopped eating sugar and processed food, my ex-wife said to me, because obviously then my son, Judy's coming around to stay with me and, my pantry and my fridge is very, very different to his pantry and fridge at home. It was actually very, very difficult to feed him because he would just turn his nose up at everything. And I remember his, uh, his mom telling to me, uh, I don't want you to give my kid body issues. I, I don't want him to have issues with food and not eating stuff. Um, so you, you really do have to be very consciously aware of that. Yes. That's, you know, and, um, and I think, the way to do that is not by saying don't do this don't do this and don't do that is but exactly what you said ruby is here are the here are the reasons why this isn't in my house here, yeah here are the here are the reasons why people eat this stuff here are the reasons that i don't eat this stuff uh we don't have it in the home uh, you could do what you want with it when you, your mum's but we don't eat here and here, this is why and, and and jude at the time for example he was mad on uh diet coke uh -huh. Uh, and and, and yeah, and now now we go out. Uh, you just wa water every time. Water, water, water. And this is why I found with kids as well, Ruby. Is all of a sudden they forget all that education and they think they've made their own decision. So <laughs> the Jude will turn around and say, um, "Yeah, I don't drink uh, Coke anymore because like sugar is like a poison and it's no good for you, and I don't want that shit in my body." And I'd be like, "Yeah, I've been telling you that for years." He'd be like, "No, no." It's like they want to own right. it. Right. Well, I think as they get older, too, it's like they're, they're so ripe for anti-authoritarian, you know, rebellious uh, behavior. Um, and not putting something in your body that's the norm is rebellious. And I think, you know, in, in, in that vein, it's really important to introduce them to, like, the greatest rebels in history. You know, everybody, Martin Luther King and Che and, like, these people who were revolutionaries and, you know, um, chose so many, so many of those people had consciousness about their food and, and what they put into their bodies and how they treated other people. It was like all part of the thinking it was systemic thinking. Um, and so introducing them to rebels and, um, you know, punk rock and like, I feel like part of why I was primed to go vegan when I did in, in my early twenties was because I had a punk rock education mm. and um, looked up to these punk rock bands who, you know, I learned about, you know, systems and oppression and, you know, the man from. And so when I was introduced later to what I was putting into my body in the food system, it, it felt right in line with my values of, oh, I'm not going to be played like that by the system. And so I think preteens and teens especially um, are really into that kind of information. If you point out like, okay, it's not just our little household and what we're doing here and the, our little rules and what we're going against, like look at how society is being played yeah. and look at these figures in time who said, we don't like this. 
we don't want to do this and we're not going to be a part of it and we're going to talk about it and how cool those people were and right. how we hardly have that anymore. There's hardly any of those people around anymore leading anything. No. So it has to be individuals that, that um, become those revolutionaries. I, I, I mean, I want to just take a moment here to give a shout out to the members of the Strive Community Forum because as Ruby says, there it's when you have a, when you have a child you want to raise your child you you really want to be showing them role models that they can um, they can feel connected to you know so for example you know there are a lot of famous people out there celebrities if your kids into celebrity dumb and TVs and pop music then pick somebody who's sober who who really rocks it and say look that person doesn't drink alcohol because they can connect with that. But the reason I want to give a shout out to the Strive members is a lot of, a lot of our children look up to us as, as parents, as role models, right? And the, the people at Strive Community Forum at the moment, they're making a stand and they say, no, we're not drinking alcohol anymore. Uh, and not, not just we're not drinking alcohol, but we're going to become people who don't drink alcohol. And that, that's a particular way of living. It, you know, they, they, they meditate, they do yoga, they're mindful, they spend more time with their kids and, and their family than, than in pubs and restaurants and going disco dancing and everything that they care about the world, they, they like to give back. And, and all that that Strive are doing now, their children are looking at that and they're thinking to myself, wow, um, my, my parents are pretty cool. They'll, they'll certainly, when they might not say it now they're kids, but my, my boy now is 17. Uh, and I, I know for a fact that he's very, very proud of me uh, and, and the, the role that I have in society at the moment and the decisions mm -hmm. I've made. Mm -hmm. um, and he, he, he's still not right now going to say, I'm never going to drink again. The, the, the power of the system has, all, has already got him, but, he, yeah. but he's, he's able to look up at different role models. And so every single person listening to this who has children, who is thinking to themselves, you know, I've got a problem with alcohol. That's why I've decided to listen to this podcast. Be a, be a role model for your children. You know, do something about it. You, you said earlier on um, when we were talking about you don't protest anymore. Yeah, it's, for you, it's, it's bigger than that, right? You need to yeah, live that I, and, Yeah, and I, I don't mean I don't protest at all, but I, I don't feel compelled to go down to participate in a protest. I did. Um, I did when I felt like, you know, the body count and the numbers were important. Mm. Um, but now, you know, my, my protest is writing essays and um, trying to get people to stop looking outside of themselves for change. Stop begging for change. You be the change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that. It's so simple and it's so powerful because you push and pull your money and that's, that's all – it's all that everything is based on is money. You pull your money out of a system that you disagree with and the system starts collapsing. There was just a report and I'm not going to give you the exact right number because I don't have it. Um, but some, there was some egg company here that says they've lost, I think it was around like 78 million in revenue to, um, and they, they attributed that to the growth of vegan alternative companies. Mm. That's a, that's a big hit to the market. Um, that's how you change things. You don't go out in the streets and beg the people in power who are completely ingrained in a system that they're benefiting off of, beg them to change the system. They're not going to. You push and pull your money. What do you say to people who say, I'm only one person, there's no need for me to change? Uh, it's happening anyway. Like people's choices are being affected by other people who are creating change, you know? So, you know, one, one of the, you know, cheaper, um, restaurant chains here is called Applebee's and it wasn't, you know, maybe with in the last couple of years, I saw a commercial where they were offering quinoa on their menu now. And I said, Oh wow. Okay. That's vegan influence. That's vegan influence in the market. People might still give us all shit, you know, for being vegan, um, but they're eating more kale and they're eating quinoa. And that is the influence of the alternative markets educating the mainstream markets on nutrients. When I go to, you know, the biggest natural foods expo where all the alternative brands are, 
first time I went there, I was shocked. I thought it was going to be a bunch of, you know, hippie companies. And I was looking on people's name tags. You know, it's like 150,000 people or something come through mm-hmm. every day. And I saw General Mills, you know, the Kellogg's company, like major giant corp food corporations. And I realized that they're there to learn. Mm-hmm. They're there to see what's on the fringes that is eventually going to become mainstream. So such an education um, on how things trickle down. But, you know, the people who say, oh, I'm just one person, you're you're one person, but you're being influenced by giant systems, also one, you know, organized by single people. Um, So it's it's giant systems and also people who are creating change who are influencing single people and the, the decisions of individuals. What, one thing that me and you have in common, and it was uh, an integral reason why I was able to quit drinking so easily in the end, is we both get very angry about uh, the system, about we don't want to be puppets. You know, you know, we don't want anyone's hand up our ass. Uh, probably wrong metaphor there. but um, <laughs> And I remember reading a study on smoking where they had um, – they had a group of teenagers or teenagers, maybe early 20s. Uh, and they were early 20s because they were in university. And they, they, sh- they, they were smokers. And they showed them lots of imagery of how uh, smoking damages your lungs, your heart, every, all that kind of stuff. And then they had another group over the same time period. And they educated them on the system about the way that marketing was fooling people into wanting to smoke. And then they run the trial mm-hmm. over a prolonged period mm-hmm. of time to see who would, uh, where, who would have the highest success rate of quitting. And it was the people who got angry about being controlled. So I always, yeah. say, I always say to people when we do the training course with alcohol, um, get very, very, very angry that no matter where you go around the UK, for example, for me, you will see adverts for alcohol everywhere selling you and your children an amazing emotional experience. Mm-hmm. Because of, it's because of that constant bombardment, 10,000 ads a day, I think it is, that we're being subjected to. Uh, even um, increasing even more now, Ruby, when you think about our social media exposure. Yeah. You know, my son was 17 today. Everybody's going on his Facebook uh, page uh, and saying happy birthday. And how many of them have been putting little emoticons of uh, pints of lager? He's right. seven, 17. So, so ad, our adverts are getting even more exploding. So if you're listening to this, you know, please, please, please use that anger and channel that anger into change. Let it tip you over the edge. So you say to yourself, I'm not fucking taking this anymore. I don't want my children growing up in this environment and I am going to be the change. I am going to do something about it. You know, Ruby writes books. I created a movement. Maybe that isn't for you, but just not drinking or if, um, you know, veganism is attractive to you, just not eating meat or not eating dairy, you're making a huge change, not to just to your children, but other people's children who look up to you. Because how many of us have kids who the, the friends come around, you're making them an alternative, and you have to explain to them why you're making an alternative, or you explain to them, like I do, why I don't drink alcohol. You, you, your exposure to people is amazing, Ruby, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And I, th- I think uh, just following up on a couple of things a- that anger can be used in a healthy way. Um, if you channel it properly, yeah. um, I think, you know, you also have to have a conversation with your kids, um, no matter what the topic is, whether it's meat or sugar or alcohol, that not everyone cares. And that's just it because they're going to ask, well, why do they do it? Yeah. You know, why does so-and-so do it? So not everybody cares. And that's why it's even more important for you to care because not everybody does. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it brings up, you know, the, when my books came out there, each of them was called uh, brainwashing. I was brainwashing children with veganism. Mm. It's actually impossible to brainwash a child um, when the mass media is advertising you know, like our, our one little message against how many ads they experience during the day of meat or alcohol um, far outweighs what little old veganism can do. 
Um, so you can't be brainwashing them against, you know, the main systems or, or against not drinking. Those messages are going to get to them no matter what. So it's just about, uh, again, just understanding the motivations. And I think the, the other thing you brought up with people who are shown the truth and shown how they're being played, I think kids can, uh, I think that's great thing to expose kids to, to whether it's the lungs or even for children, you know, how the, how the cigarette industry uses animals and the awful footage of, you know, the, the masks on the dogs and, you know, forced, forced inhalation of smoke. Nobody likes to see that. A hundred percent of any healthy human being looking at that footage is going to be like, that's wrong. And I don't want any part of that. So I think a lot of the times if kids still want to do the thing that you're trying to have them not do, ultimately, you haven't given them enough information. Yeah, I, I, I think what you're saying there is uh, super important. It, I've just been feeding my daughter, you know, she's 17 months and I've been trying, she won't eat, she won't eat anything. I'm trying to like feed her all these different things and I'm f facing a losing battle. And then, then I start saying oh pretend you're a hungry caterpillar like eric <laughs> carl's book right uh -huh. so and it works because she starts you know she starts pretending she's a hungry caterpillar but then when i think about it at the back end of eric carl's book the hungry caterpillar what does the caterpillar do he eats a lot of shit right he eats, <laughs> he eats the cake he eats a, a, a lollipop and all these different types of things when I read her the farm animal books and she's going, bah, and uh, cow, uh, all the first animal, the first, not word, but, uh, you know, a sound was identifying that the cow goes moo. That was her first ever word. And at some point, you're going to have to have a conversation whereby you're saying, oh, this is what we do to these animals that you've grown to love. You know, I, I, I think what you're doing, Ruby, just to emphasize it, giving parents like me an alternative to be able to give them different books because my child loves books. All she wants to do is read books. And if, if, if we're going to be reading them, The Hungry Caterpillar, eating a load of um, ice cream and all these different things, and I can hear you listening and, and talking away, people listening to this now, you're thinking to yourself, these being stupid, hungry caterpillars have been around since the 1930s and kids aren't going to worry about it. I think it all matters. I, I really do. I think every single part matters because it's, it's incongruent. How, 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 can you, how can your kid be raised on hungry caterpillar eating shit and you saying that this is, this is a great book and this is a great character? And then all of a sudden you're saying sugar's really bad. So I think what I think what people have a knee-jerk reaction to is like Hi. that we're ruining some beautiful experience, which you know, everybody loves the hungry caterpillar. Everybody remembers that book. So you don't want to ruin the experience for a kid of, of that the magic of that book. And I don't think you should. Um, but in a different conversation, you know, you can bring up like, oh, The Hungry Caterpillar was written in 19-whatever. They didn't, they didn't really know about, you know, they weren't really thinking about sugar or, or this or that. And so, you know, you don't, you don't take anything, you don't have to take anything away from the joy. Well, well the, the, the cat, actually, the caterpillar, now I'm thinking about it, the caterpillar does get sick after eating all that <laughs> and has to eat and has to eat three green leaves there to get go. better before it goes in a cocoon. So, okay, rather than being just a passive parent, just reading the book while you're flicking around on Facebook on your phone, you can be more immersive by explaining, oh, look what happens to the caterpillar when he eats these things. Yeah. And look how he gets better. He eats these green things. Right, so, which makes him feel better. He yeah. decided. Right. And if you're a drinker, right? If you're a drinker, you are not going to be present for your kids. You, you, you're not going to be there. You, the, the people who listen to this podcast and the people who come to Strive, who are struggling, all they think about is drink. They, they, they think all the time about getting it. They think about the fact that they don't want to drink it, but they haven't got any control over it. And, and all the time they're doing that, they're not able to be present for their children. I was never present, Ruby, 
for my 17 year old boy never present for him now i'm 100 percent focused on this little thing that i have now who, who just tried to run here a minute ago um, <laughs> and, and 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 it makes a big big difference big big difference do you think and does does your older boy um does he understand your your feelings about your history with him yeah completely he he tells me that he would never want to change it he believes that i was always a wonderful father he believes he has a great childhood what he struggles to accept is that things could have been so much better mm. had i been more present and paid more attention to him we could have we could have done more things together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I was the type of guy, if I had a choice of playing with my son or getting drunk watching a football, the football and getting drunk would always come first because I would take my son for granted, right? I would, he's always going to be there. You know, this day, this match is not going to be here again type of thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and it, most of the people who come to Strive, who have... Um, children they're very very aware that the way that they're behaving is going to rub off on their children so um, weed smokers uh, where I live the kids always grow up smoking weed like natural um, all the drink all the drinkers end up drinking and and they think it's genetic you'll hear them saying why well, it's genetic it's a brain disease it's obvious because my dad's um a drinker well my dad was a drinker but he's i haven't got a single drop of his blood in my body mm -hmm. the reason that i'm like him is because i spent all my time in and around him watching him and learning yeah. from him. you know it's like it's decoded in you to look at him and say that is what i need to do to be a dad Mm -hmm. That is what I need to do to be a mum. Mm -hmm. and, and if you're drinking wine in an acceptable, normal way, or you're eating meat, or you're eating dairy, you're telling your child through your actions, this is the way to behave. This is the worldview. Here are the values. Here are the beliefs. You don't even have to know what a value is. I certainly didn't until I was 35 and I gave up drinking alcohol. I, I did not know what a value was. I wouldn't have been able to tell you what it was. But when I looked and wrote those core values down, they, they mirrored my parents. Uh -huh. Yeah, well, because it's normalized. And, and you know, what, what you saw and what you experienced wasn't necessarily talked about. You know, like I said, what you don't say speaks volumes. What about, so you're making, you, this is helping me a lot, this, because I'm, I'm realizing now that, because I've got two kids at either end of the spectrum, a 17 year old and a 17 month old, I'm, 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 I have to t treat them differently in a way. I have to talk to them like they're an adult, but differently. Uh -huh. You're making me think about the 17 month old now, even though she doesn't understand everything that I'm talking about, incorporating right now when I'm feeding her, what instead of just shoving pasta in her mouth, talking about, while I'm doing it, how it was made, where it's from, um, the, the different fruits and vegetables, playing around with them, letting it help you to cook them, letting it help you choose them from the supermarket. It, it's really important at, at the early age, just as much as it is if you're listening to this and you just want to start having conversations with your, your kid at 12, 13. Um, one question I want to ask you, though, is, what happens if you're, you've been a certain way with your kids up to a certain point, like I was with Jude, so up to nine years of age, uh -huh. I, ne I never had these types of conversations with him. And then you just suddenly decide to give up drinking and be vegan. That is well, at, at that point, you've learned something that made you decide to transform and whatever that piece of knowledge was can be shared. I think that's really critical. Right. And I guess a lot of adults will be worried about sharing their shame. Sharing their shame? Yeah. Um, like, I, like a lot of times when someone decides they want to quit drinking, it's because they've done a lot of things that are very shameful in their life, right? That's a, I think that's a great, I think admission is a great thing to share with a child. You don't need to go into all the details, um, but to say, I just realized, hey, 
I just realized it just happened to me right now at this age. And I'm an adult that something that I was doing was not right. And I'm going to change it right now, even though it's really hard to change habits, even though this is difficult, I'm making a decision. I think that's great. That is a great lesson that at any moment, we all have the power to create a new day, to, to create the first step of a new journey. Um, and for a kid to understand that, you know, adults are not, they're not gods. We have, you know, we're just human. Everyone's just trying their best at every moment. Um, just to, to be included in, in, the, in the understanding of growth and transformation. Um, when someone decide when one when the household has been one way and then the parent decides they're on a new journey, they can share whatever revelation they just had with the kid. When I when I was explaining veganism, my veganism to my students, I decided to show them, um, you know, a, a four or five minute under, piece of undercover footage you know, that one of the animal organizations put out. Mm. And, you know, had I gone to ask for permission, I'm sure I would have been shot down. Mm. Um, but it, it wasn't, it was, wasn't the worst footage I've ever seen, you know, but it was enough of a glimpse of the battery cages and the slaughterhouses uh, where it was balanced between not sugarcoating and you yeah. know, not scaring them. Um, but to have that piece of information, to witness it, was so important for the kids because it's, it's otherwise completely hidden. So any kind of internal transformation that you're having, I think as long as you make your kid feel like they're ultimately supported and they're taken care of no matter what's going on with you, um, I think it's a really beautiful thing to include them in how someone decides to make a change in their life. I mean, I would go even deeper than saying it's beautiful. I, I would say it's a necessity. Um, the more I'm listening to you talk, the more my cogs are whirring away in my mind. We almost universally, people who arrive on the Strive Forum end up sharing with other members of Strive things about their life, their experiences and the change that they've never talked to anyone else about before. And 99.9% .9 of them are married. So that means that these people are not even sharing their wow. worries, their fear or their, their change to their husbands and wives. That's and so lonely. It is terrible. And, and, and what I mean when I say their change, they obviously they've said to their partner, I don't want to drink or I don't, They've either said, I don't want to drink ever again, or I don't want to drink this month, or I'm, 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 they've said something like that. But that's very surface level. They haven't gone beneath it to say, look, um, look, Ruby, I just want you to know that I'm really, really struggling with alcohol right now. It's making me feel terrible. I'm not present for the kids. My connection with you is waning. And... I just, it's, it, it's making me feel terrible. I want it out of my life and I really, really need your support with this. Mm -hmm. And this is what support looks like for me, right? Mm -hmm. That conversation isn't happening. Mm -hmm. And we talk on Strive a lot about trying to create the tools uh, and to help people to have those conversations. What we never, ever talk about until right now is how to have those conversations with our children. Mm -hmm. we, we, we don't even consider to have these conversations with our children. And well, and we're, we're told not to because, because of this false concept of childhood that we need to maintain uh, their purity and their innocence and that they're frail and fragile and completely dependent on adults for, you know, everything. That's a, it's, there's no universal concept of childhood. It doesn't exist. The concept of childhood itself is an inven invention. You know, at some point in history, there were no children's books or children's songs or children's clothing. It was all one. It was all the same thing. I it wasn't until the invention um, and the introduction of Christianity and the idea of um, purity 
that there started to be a concept of making sure children had a very pure and innocent life. I think it's really important as well, Ruby, that people recognize and understand that if you are not talking to your children about this because you want to preserve purity, innocence, and their so-called fragility, you need to wake the fuck up, right? Yeah, because, what, are you, what are you actually protecting them from? Well, well, the way I see it, if you think you're protecting it, like you're, you're deluded because your kids will all have electronic devices. Um, if, they're not, if they haven't got access to porn and God knows what else is on there, somebody else in the schoolyard is, is showing them, right. you certainly don't have any control of the, of the ads and marketing. How many parents out there, even with the best will at heart, end up sticking him in front of the TV and just, you know, just letting him get on with it while they just, they can't handle it. They need to clean the house. They got three kids running around here. I'll put a fucking telly on and, and the ads are hitting them. Even, even just, I was in London last week and I'm stood on the tube platform waiting to go from one station to another and there's alcohol adverts everywhere. Yeah. If I take my children to the cinema and they're under 15, they will be bombarded with a proliferation of sweet adverts. When I take Jude to the cinema, who's over 15, uh, we took, go to an 18 plus movie, what's he bombarded with? Alcohol, right? So, right, and I think it's important to, to make the kids feel like, that's okay, those can be there, but we know better. Like we're not gonna have any anxiety or rage about what's there. Yeah. We're just going to choose differently. We're not going to I I'm I'm not even talking about having that conversation actually. I mean, we are having that conversation, but my point on my little rant is if you think you're protecting the purity, you're not because of all these outside external influences. What you do Right, need you're actually just creating a vacuum in which other people can educate your children for yes, you. Yes. Exactly. And if uh, when I when I when my second book came out, um, I was on Fox News, which is conservative um, TV station here, and they had me on. I was arguing live with a child psychologist who was saying this is an inappropriate book for children. You can't talk about animal agriculture and slaughterhouses with children. Um, and his final line was, "Stay away from this book." And this was, uh, I think he was the editor in chief maybe of psychology today at some point, some you know, high profile magazine. And I thought just about the insanity of that, that, uh, that, that the, you know, him as a representation of psychology today would say it's better to not talk about something than to talk about something and teach your kids how to manage their feelings and their questions mm -hmm. about any topic doesn't have to be veganism in anything. I thought that was just insane. And to think about the child you build with that foundation versus the child who's talked to and communicated to and learns how to process their inner life and, and make choices that way. What a stronger human being that creates. Oh, no, no doubt. And what that, what that, uh, what that psychologist is doing in effect is he's, He's, he's playing the stereotype, isn't he? It's like Melanie Joy, uh, who was a guest on the podcast uh, mm -hmm. a couple of episodes ago. You know, Melanie Joy coined this term carnism, didn't she? An invisible, yeah. dominant, violent belief system. And the reason it's invisible, carnism is, in, is invisible, is because people like that want to hide the truth from our children. You know, and it's exactly the same with alcoholism. You see, this is why you'll see on the bottom of every advert in alcohol in Britain, in drink responsibly. You know, mm -hmm. there'll be an advert selling sex, sea and sangria, and then, oh, but do it responsibly. So they're, they're putting the blame back on the individual. They say, oh, look, we're going to create this poison um, and we're going to sell it to you, but it ain't our fucking problem if you drink too much of it. I mean, right. what That's a load of nonsense. You. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a load of absolute nonsense. Um, one last question. I think that's great. That's great to point out. You know, this exact conversation is great to point out. It's the same as the billboard conversation, same as the happy cow. You know, all of it is, is I think, topic for discussion with kids. Yeah, and, and I think, I think, I think it's best to drip feed him. If I'm honest about one mistake I've made in life, and maybe this is because I went through divorce. So when I saw my son, I felt like I had to squeeze two weeks worth of parenting into one day. Mm -hmm. um, is applying too much, too much of one thing. Yeah. 
you know so i think it's better to naturalize it so at dinner times you can talk about what you're eating and not and 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 like i think what you said earlier on which i thought was really really important instead of preaching and there's a fine line here is to ask questions yeah you know i think i think that is um really the way to go forward here um yeah why one last question i'll let you go why why are not more people doing this why aren't more people saying i've had enough of this i am going to be the agent of change why why aren't they marching down the street ruby why aren't they refusing to buy chicken why aren't they refusing to drink alcohol why are they taking the path of least resistance every time I think that's just it is people um, these systems are so profoundly ingrained and people don't want to feel like they're sacrificing something like they have to give something up. Um, But that is also a myth because, you know, when I, when I gave something up is when I gained so much in my life. So I never thought of veganism as subtractive um, because it was like, I think I said this earlier, turning over a little pebble and finding a mountain. Mm. Um, I think, you know, the, the so much, um, so much potential for good is muddied by business. You know, for example, um, all of the Greenpeace and eco organizations who know that animal agriculture is the number one polluter, but they won't actually talk about it on their websites or in their campaigns because they don't want to offend or lose their base that gives them money for eco stuff to save the air and to save the water. Um, Because they know ultimately people would rather throw money at a problem than actually change their own habits and behavior. People would rather pop a pill for cholesterol um, then make a small change in their life that actually ultimately makes them gain everything, um, all the health that can be gained. So it's really tackling um, individual awareness and consciousness as we've been talking about from childhood so that the systems aren't more powerful than the individual mind. It's it's really paradoxical when I think about it because I think what's happening is that people are so terrified of being different to everybody else. So well, you are you are punished the second you step outside of the norm. Right. I you know my own little teeny fifteen minutes of fame, um, you know quote unquote fame in the media is a perfect example of that. It's like mm-hmm. nobody was celebrating what I was doing. It was all ostracizing, creating doubt, yeah. um, putting down, degrading. Um, that's, that's, you can expect that when you make a change, yeah. whether you know, it's your food or your alcohol or um, a new habit in the family that you will experience pushback. That's a universal, I mean, that's universal spirituality even, mm-hmm. um, that that's, you will immediately feel the effects of a test. And, you know, and that's maybe, you know, the world testing your commitment so, right away. You make a change. It's like you, all of your demons will come out and say, oh, you think you want to change? We're going to make go. your life a living hell. Let's go. Let's see. Let's so, see. So you change. Everybody tries to make your life a living hell. So you then look at your kids and think, I don't want them to go through the same. I don't want my kid to be bullied in school. I don't want my kid to, to be different. Yeah. But if those kids have the image of the hero, you know, whether it's the punk rock hero or the um, social justice hero, or, you know, the, the, any of our historical heroes that went against the grain um, and how cool that is, then it's not really, you, you're empowering the child to be different you know, than, than the masses. Yeah. I, I, that's what I was going to end on. It's like, when I was a kid, I was half Chinese, English living in Wales. Like nobody was Chinese and I was half Chinese. So I got, I got half picked on. Now I was picked on all (laughs) the time. Right. Mm. 
And I hated being different. But at the same time, I kind of secretly liked it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I stood up for myself and I fought. I had so many fights against people so much bigger than me. Um, I look back at my kids now. And yet there is a, a nurturing part of me that wants to keep them out of danger. Mm -hmm. Wants them to fit in. But I don't, I, but I teach them, I teach them to be individual, to be autonomous, to be critical thinking, to not follow the herd. I'm always saying to you, why do you think, why do you think that? Why do you think you think that? Like, why, why, why are you wearing this? Why are you wearing it? Where, where, what are you thinking? You know, um, I want them to realize that they're much, the part of a, a system, but they don't have to be a part of that system. You know, there's a game to be played, but um, at the same time, they need to embrace being different. And I think. Yeah, and that's fun. Like all of this you were saying, it shouldn't, you know, it doesn't have to be so heavy handed. No, no. You can kind of create a culture of rebellion in your households, you know, with music and with film and podcasts and, you know, characters and you just, it can be fun. It's fun. We're enjoying, we're celebrating. And um, there's so much inspiration to be had in, in that culture of. I, 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 that's my wife. That is my, my <laughs> wife, my wife is the fun. She would do it your way. I, 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 I'm, I'm kind of like, I need to learn a lot there. Well, there's, uh, there can be a balance. That's okay. Yeah, yeah. But, but yeah, let's end, let's end there in terms of, although it's, although I get it folks, that it is really difficult to look at your kid and you want them to be the same. You want them to eat cake at parties when kids are eating cake. You want them to go to McDonald's and eat burgers with the other kids who eat burgers, all that kind of stuff. But, Think about where we ended up and why we're at the truth about alcohol right now. Why we're at Strive. Why you're listening to this. 99.9% .9 of us are, are, are here because we were culturally kind of like created to think and act like everybody else. We don't want our children to do the same thing. So um, just have a think about that. Uh, Ruby, it's been a wonderful pleasure. I've really enjoyed uh, my time with you. Just before you go, what's your next project? What have you got in the pipeline? When are you next on Fox News being abused by people? <laughs> I can't wait. Um, I do have a new book in the works, um, a couple of new books, one in the adult space and one in the kids space. Um, it's not going to be vegan specific. It'll be more for all kids. Um, I haven't announced anything, but people can stay tuned on um, find me on, on at we don't eat animals .com and draw or die .com. Um, That's the full range of my kids stuff and my non kid stuff, even though to me it's all the same. So yeah. stay tuned and um, we'll love to check back in with you in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, let's definitely keep in touch. I've, uh, you've got me thinking quite a lot after this today's chat. So thank you. Awesome. My pleasure.